Hi. So this is an example of problem for a standard strategy problem that involves a rotational motion. So, um, so let's work through this question. We have a setup with a pivot. So imagine a rod is nailed to a wall at a point in a way that it can rotate freely. Um, on one end is a mass, M1, and at the other end is another mass, M2. So if we set up this system and let go, it'll start to rotate. So that's what the question is addressing. So let's uh, work through that. By the way, this question is a little bit long, so it's taking up a lot of the board space. So let me erase some of the parts so that I will have space to work it out. Uh, one second. All right. So the question asks, what is the moment of inertia of the system about the pivot? So this one looks like it's made up of two simple point masses, M1 and M2. So we are going to treat the sum of those two point masses. Recall that rotational inertia of a point mass is given by its mass times the r squared. Um, r stands for the distance from the, uh, the center of rotation. So here the mass m1 is at a distance d away and mass m2 is at a distance l minus d away. So here the total rotation inertia would be rotation inertia of, M, of M1. So M1 d squared plus the rotation inertia of M2. So M2 times the distance squared. So it'll be L minus d squared. All right, that's it. That's the uh, rotational inertia of the whole object. Uh, this is an answer that we'll need in future parts, so I'll just keep it here. So it says, paralleling our standard strategy for solving problems with Newton's laws, find the net torque and angular acceleration about the pivot point at the instant shown. All right, so we should start out with a free body diagram. Let me make some space here. All right, let me draw the forces. So there's going to be a force of gravity on these masses, M1, M1g, and the force of gravity on M2, M2g. And when you think about this carefully, there's actually a third force. There is going to be a force at the pivot point due to contact with the pivot. And I guess the rough direction of this force goes like this, um, F pivot. So if we are dealing only with the net torque, then we don't have to worry about this pivot force because it's, uh, the R is zero, so it'll produce zero torque. So, all right, let's make a P the center of rotation so we can simply so forget about P, uh, F pivot, and we only have to worry about the torque due to M1G and torque due to M2G. So, Torque due to M1G is going to be counterclockwise. Let's call that positive. And torque due to M2G is going to be clockwise. Let's call that negative. Then we have information to calculate the net torque. We can say that the net torque is equal to the positive torque of force M1G times the distance D times there's supposed to be sine theta, but here theta is equal to 90 degrees, so it's just going to be one. So this is the torque in the positive direction. So we have to add to this the torque in the negative direction. So minus M2G distance L minus D times sine theta. Um, well, that's once again 90 degrees, so um, just one. Um, so I guess I can factor out some stuff. So it would be G times, and I think I can actually factor out D. So let me write out that form. D times M1 plus M2. Um, the first term is taken care of. Second term 
S minus um, L M two. So that's the net torque. Well, that's uh, one half of the answer. So let me underline it. This is the net torque. And now we need to find the angular acceleration. So this is where the analogy is helpful. So you use the analogy to force is, or rather, red net force is equal to mass times acceleration. So here the analogy is the net torque is equal to the rotational inertia, I, of the uh, total object times angular acceleration alpha. So it's looking for angular acceleration. So I can solve this for alpha. Then I get angular acceleration is equal to the net torque divided by rotational inertia. So this is the form of expression that you would have expected for translational motion. All of these analogies made in purpose. So we plug in the values of the net torque and the total rotation inertia that we came up with. Net torque is equal to G times uh, D M1 plus M2 minus L M2 divided by M1 D squared plus M2 L minus D L minus D squared. Hmm. I am not seeing obvious cancellation, so I'll just leave it as it is. So this is the rotational. Um, so this is the angular acceleration. And if you check the unit, you will see that it works out. The units work out to be meter per second squared. So that's the second and the last part of the answer to part B. So, all right, that's it. Parts A and B. Let's uh, uh, get a new board for parts C and D. All right. So the problem says that the after the masses rotate for a while, they are in this position of problem two. Part C asks if the rotation inertia of the system changes. And when you think through it carefully, you should see that it doesn't. This distance from mass to the pivot point is still D. I mean, the horizontal distance is different, but that whole distance is still D. And this distance from the pivot point to the mass is still L minus D. So, um, so the rotation inertia doesn't change. The rotation inertia of the system is still M1 D squared plus M2 L minus D squared. Now it says to draw a free body diagram for the rod in the new position. Well, let's see. So let me, so first let me copy the bigger figure. All right, I should start by drawing the forces. So there's still the force of N1G um, acting vertically on this mass and still the force of M2G acting vertically on this mass. And if I'm being picky again, there's a still F pivot here, which um, will make everything come out right in terms of the net force. Now, what you hopefully realize here is that um, even though the force did not change and the rotation inertia didn't change, the uh, lever arm uh, for the force to the pivot has changed. So this is the, so to the pivot has changed. So this is the lever arm, R perpendicular for one. And here's the lever arm for R perpendicular two. So this is the level arm for another R perpendicular. So this level arm is shorter than before. It's uh, the distance before times cosine of phi. So um, that's going to affect the, the net torque. So let me write down the net torque. The net torque is equal to the torque due to counterclockwise positive um, torque, um, M1G times 
times the lever arm, that would be d cosine of phi. That's the positive quantity. Minus the negative quantity is the torque due to m2. So m to g, the distance is still um, L minus D, but we take only the lever arm component. So multiply by cosine of phi. So that's the net torque. And as before, the angular acceleration is equal to net torque divided by rotation inertia. So when you write it out, this is what you get. Angular acceleration is equal to, um, I guess I can factor out g cosine phi. So g cosine phi times m1d minus m2 l minus d all of that divided by the total rotation inertia which is said that it didn't change m1 d squared plus m2 l minus d squared all right will this simplify anymore hmm i don't see an obvious way this will simplify so um to get the final final answer what you would have to do is plug in all the given values including cosine of phi uh, 30 degrees and when you plug in all those numbers to this expression you will see that yes the value does depend on the angle phi so here the angular acceleration is not constant so if you were to be asked what is the velocity of the masses then um, you can't do it directly from standard strategy because your angular acceleration will most likely be non-constant. So instead you have to use conservation of energy. That's how we'll do some problems that you will see um, in a little bit. Bye.